It is hard to teach your child to sleep independently. We're built biologically to respond to every noise that a child makes as though there's a crisis. And if you look at history, it's only in the last few decades that those cries haven't meant that they're in danger. We have the luxury of teaching them how to be independent sleepers so that they can meet the next challenges, the challenges of our day, our time. Being a mom is the toughest job there is, and it doesn't come with instructions. So it's okay if you don't have all the answers. We'll figure it out together. This is Mom Brain with Ilaria Baldwin and Daphne Oz. My name is Janet Crone Kennedy. I'm a clinical psychologist and mom of two. Uh, my kids are now 11 and 14, so I'm uh, out of your phase of mom brain. Um, I specialize in sleep, and my practice is called NYC Sleep Doctor. I started out working with adults with sleep disorders at the Manhattan VA Hospital about 15 years ago, maybe more, and eventually went into private practice to do that work with adults and then also work with families of young kids uh, who are struggling to get out of the cycle of bad sleep. And I also have a book called The Good Sleeper, The Essential Guide to Sleep for Your Baby and You that is available anywhere books are sold. And I am in the process of developing my own podcast to bring this kind of work out to more people. <laughs> you are a exotic bird for us because we have seven children amongst us and we don't sleep very well. And we're very different. I am like, sleep in my bed. I don't ever want to upset you. And Daphne is like strong, independent woman and understands that structure and sleep is important. Am I describing you right, Larry? Well, I also just think I got really lucky. And for the most part, my kids are good sleepers. So my daughter, Philomena, my oldest, who sort of, and your oldest kind of trains you in parenting in that way. She, at seven months after being in and out of our bed, in and out of her crib, like really not sleeping well through the night, um, decided that at the end of a weekend where we traveled together and she was in our bed the whole weekend and none of us slept well, she fell asleep in the car on the way home and did not wake up till the next morning. Scared the bejesus out of yeah. everyone in the family <laughs> because I you know, woke up and was like, ah, something terrible happened. And she was happy as a clam. And I saw that day how well rested and how comfortable she was having gotten that opportunity to sleep through the night. And, um, and that can... And that, plus the rest of her life, she's now five, has convinced me uh, both on the positive and the negative. When she gets a good night's sleep, she's a different child than when she gets a, a bad night's sleep. My second, uh, John, um, it took him longer to sleep through the night. but uh, And he's also now one of those people who falls asleep really quickly. But when he's up, he's up. And I think... Again, I, I, my, before I had kids, I'd be a late sleeper. I love to sleep in. And my daughter used to sleep in. And, and my son, when he would get up early, I would like try to convince him to go back to sleep. I would rock him and try to put him back to sleep. I would let him, I would put toys in his crib and let him try to play and go back to sleep. It, kids are different. Some kids, once yeah. they're up, they are up. And I think that's what's been, and my daughter, Nika, our third, came out of the womb basically sleeping through the night. So I, <laughs> I know, I knock wood for myself, and I know that that's a, like a far stretch for lots of people who have p kids who aren't great sleepers. Um, but I do think I got lucky in that way. And I also recognize that something that has has been proven to me is the value of good sleep for adults and for for children. Absolutely. And and I'm, you know, I think, Alara, you you don't need as much sleep as some people do also. But I think it's starting to catch up with me. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I'm tired. Because I need um, that sleep. Like, if, I have, if I'm going for four hours a night for weeks on end, I just, I, I'm, a shell, I'm a shell. I don't It's know. so critical, too, because, you know, we're so, we educate ourselves as parents. We're looking for all the best things to do. We want to do right by our kids. And we can't be those parents if we're not sleeping. And, the, of course, the first step to doing that is to get your kids sleeping and teach them the value of good sleep. Teach them to listen to their bodies so that when they're tired, they're accepting sleep and not fighting it. Yes. But I mean, it, it is that hard thing. Like I would love to, and basically, okay. So Carmen, my five-year-old sleeps in her bed and she is that one. I go in there, I can put her to sleep. It was a lot getting there, but we figured it out. I can put her to sleep. And she's a very, very, very heavy sleeper. It's amazing. Like anything can be going, you can turn the lights on, you can talk really loud. She will not wake up. <laughs> uh, Rafa is uh, my three-year-old. Very, very, very light sleeper. Very difficult to go to bed. Leo and Rafa sleep together. Really nice in some ways. 
really difficult for going to sleep like really really difficult so when i put them to sleep they're both fighting over and i know you're not supposed to be in the bed with them but it's just like they 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 convince me to and then like then they want me to be in their bed both of them at the same time then they start fighting over then they get out of bed and they start like beating each other or they have like their beds like the heads facing each other and there's this table in between i'll sit on the table and put like (laughs) stretch my arms and legs so they can each like touch me but then it's like sometimes two hours of that before they'll finally fall asleep it's it's torture so it's here's what torture. I'm wondering, though, because I've listened to a few of your podcasts and you talk about your very structured bedtime routine, mm-hmm. but it sounds like somewhere it falls off the rails and you're not in charge in that moment. It's that one. And it is the mommy factor. Like if Alec goes in there, so I'll disappear at one time. I know not good to do because then they don't trust you, but I'll disappear at some point. So I have like my structured routine. I'll disappear. Alec will read them stories, tell them to go to bed, and they just do that. Right. Whereas if I'm there... Get, like and and it's funny because I am the disciplinarian. Alec does not discipline them when they've done something bad. When I anything, I am the one that's a disciplinarian. But when it comes to comfort and sleep, I nursed all of them. I've been pregnant and or bre- breastfeeding for you know over six years now because I got pregnant breastfeeding each child. Okay. Um, and when they're breastfeeding, I have them in bed with me because I'm too tired to do that whole put them down, bring them up, go pump, do this. I can't once I am out of my bed unless somebody's sick or something. It's just it's a horrible day for me the next day. And so I eventually started falling asleep, not planned, with holding my my first baby. Mm-hmm. And I'm a very stationary light sleeper, and Alec is a very stationary light sleeper. So we're it's like no. It's not dangerous and then I did that with all of my children but then they still have that comfort of mommy when you're in the same room with me I want you to be holding me and then when it comes again with Carmen it's fine but with the boys because there's two of them and one of me and they don't I at some point I thought of putting them in the same bed but then they kill each other it's (laughs) a bad idea it did not work at all um so yeah so I think what's important in that in that scenario is that you are still the parent in that moment and that you can set up the routine on your terms. It's just about being clear and consistent about what the limits are, what you are going to do and what you're not going to do. So it's really, really important for kids to fall asleep alone, not with the parents in the room, because learning how to accept the comfort and the soothing from the parent and then finish off and do the self-soothing and fall asleep by yourself is key to sleeping through the night because we all wake up during the night whether you're aware of it or not we wake up we go into a lighter phase of sleep after deeper phases and if kids don't know how to put themselves to sleep then they can't put themselves back to sleep Mm -hmm. and they're going to be wanting either the breast or the bottle or soothing or just attention Um, and So getting them to the point where they can be by themselves and fall asleep independently is really key. Um, So that means that whatever's happening in your routine, you're building up to your exit and you're communicating to them that this is the time we have together. I'm doing what what we agreed to. Um, This is what you need. This is what I need. And then the last thing you need is for me to go and for you to get the sleep that you need. Mm -hmm. Partly because they're anticipating your departure. And if you're waiting until they're asleep to leave, they have no motivation to go to sleep. It's it's That's almost like, yeah, yeah, they'll delay it as long as they can. And so there's this push pull of like, I want to sleep, I'm tired, but I don't really because I know I'll be alone then. Um, so it's almost, it's like separation anxiety in general. Mm-hmm. Like if you're spending a lot of time trying to get your child to be happy to say goodbye to you, you're really just prolonging that separation that's inevitable and they have a lot of extra time to get anxious. So at bedtime in particular, because they're tired, it's dark, it's a long time to be alone, even though they're asleep, um, that anxiety can be heightened. And we as parents are more vulnerable to that as well because we feel like we should take it away, we can take it away, it's easier to take it away. It's hard to pull ourselves away because we also have memories of what it's like to be scared at night or to, you know, to not be able to sleep and, and how frustrating that can be or even just how boring it can be. Yeah. <laughs> so, so as a parent, want first of all, you want to make your kids happy and comfortable and you are under this, uh, you know, 
you, you keep thinking you'll rationalize with them. You keep thinking right. like, okay, if I stay five more minutes, that'll fill it up. You know, that's that's not how babies or kids work. They it's want not. you just to stay forever. And you make a really good point, which is they know you'll leave once they're asleep. So why would I go to sleep? Right. Um, and I remember at some point when, when uh, John was little and he was not a great sleeper, especially the first year, um, I had spoken with another sleep specialist. And one thing that she'd mentioned to me that I thought was really interesting was she said two things. One is you have to be consistent and you have to have a clear pattern of of before, you know, babies have no concept of time. They don't know it's nighttime. They don't know it's 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. and it's bedtime. So what signals that to them is they eat their dinner, they have their bath time, you read the books, you sing the songs, you say the prayers, you put them to bed. And she said, even before they're verbal, you say, you know, mommy loves you. I'm coming back in the morning, but I'm not coming back until the morning. And then, you know, you you shut the door. And, and at a certain point, you you can go back in, but it's really more about you feeling like, oh, I'm being, I have to respond. I have to be there. I have right. to be the parent. I don't want to abandon them. It actually just prolongs their suffering because every time you go in there, it resets the valve. Absolutely. And it makes them think that if they fight it, that you'll come back again. And then it's torturous for both of you. And I think that that was something that was a, a big it just let me take a breath as a parent to feel like I'm making myself feel better in this moment, but it's actually very selfish and it right. resets my child's suffering and doesn't actually make me feel any better because I'm still sitting out at the door like weeping that this is a, a process that it's we're going through. It's teasing when you go in yeah. because they're used to crying and calling and getting you to come. And if you're trying to teach them a new response pattern, which is you can, when you are sleepy, go to sleep. That yeah, and that works. And you'll and, like it. it. And you can do it better than I can do it for you. Because yeah. when they're tiny, they need you to do that. But once they hit like four months, three months, four months, you start to be stimulating to them. And all the things that you're doing in that period that we now call the fourth trimester, yes. that's like so stimulating, the shushing and the bouncing and the driving and the rocking and all that stuff – becomes overstimulating to them and they mm. can't get the good sleep they need when that in that scenario. So they have to learn how to do it themselves because your hands and eyes and breath on them in is is not it's soothing but it's also stimulating and it, it does it does ignite this sort of conflict where they want more from you even though they know they mm -hmm. want to sleep. Okay, two questions. So the first one is like I would look at because I, I, I'm a yoga teacher, so I'm like super namaste, kumbaya, little hippy dippy. So I'll see, you know, pictures of gorillas holding their babies mm -hmm. and they sleep with them or koalas or otters or any of these. And I'm like, well, we're animals, too. My kid wants to be touching me while he or she is sleeping. And so there you go. And I have to deal with it. And our problem is that in society, we have gotten into a place where we need an alarm clock and we need to do this and we need to do that. And that's just something that we've created. So how are we supposed to reckon the natural and the fact that we're animals with the fact that we have created such foreign structure in our lives? And when our babies are born, they're little animals. They do it's not true. understand our structure at all. So that's my first thing. And the next thing I'm going to ask you to do is bring me through if Rafa and Leo, two and three, were your children what would you do? Okay. okay, but first, first the so the first the answer to the first question is tricky because you're right. The, we are mammals, and you know, if we all if we lived somewhere else in some different kind of society, some different kind of culture, the answer would be different. But you're choosing to be here. You're choosing to raise your kids here in this way. You're choosing to pursue the things you pursue in your life: fulfillment, success making the world a better place, all of these things that are important. And you're also providing an example to your children of a strong woman who takes care of her family and herself and the world, essentially, and, and doing the things that you do. Um, and so you can't have it both ways. And some like you you are raising your children to live in this world. And that I, you know, that sounds harsh coming out of my mouth, but I do this all the time. I teach people how to teach their children to sleep. What becomes of that is a family that works, right. a couple that stays together. <clears throat> I mean, certainly more likely than if everyone's exhausted and hating mm -hmm. each other. Um, kids who are better behaved and easier to parent. They do better in school. They separate more easily. They're nicer to their siblings. They're nicer to the dog. Like they, they, they're more flexible. They're healthier. They aren't getting sick as much. All of these things that, you know, we don't live in 
the culture of it taking a village and having a village to rely upon where if you don't sleep tonight, someone else is going to be able to help you tomorrow so you don't break down. Um, And so the fact is that we can do it. It works. It makes for healthy, happy, well, secure, securely attached children. There's a lot of discussion about how this ruins attachment. None of that is based in science. And if you want to read the appendix in my book, I've gone through all of the claims that it's going to destroy everything and looked at the actual science for that. It is hard to teach your child to sleep independently um, because it is emotional for for you and for me mm-hmm. um, because we're built biologically to respond to every noise that a child makes as though there's a crisis. Right. And if you look at the at history, it's only in the last few decades that those cries haven't meant that they're in danger. Right. We have prenatal care. We have vaccines. We know not to put our kids to sleep on their bellies with lots of s- soft bedding. We know not to smoke. And, you know, we know not to put them in the bed when we're drinking. Like, all these kinds of things that we know how to keep them safe, um, they're not in danger. And so because those challenges have all been resolved to a large extent, we have the luxury of teaching them how to be independent sleepers so that they can meet the next challenges, the challenges of our day, our time. Your question about what to do about your kids. The first thing I would say is that it's probably not realistic to leave them in a quiet room alone awake because they they don't have anything to focus on. Um, when my kids were little and sharing a room, I would put on music for them. I've been working lately with a company um, called Mashi Twilight, and they've come up with an app that I think is really great for that age range um, and for, you know, basically preschool through elementary school age and even beyond. Um, And it's an audio app. It's on your phone, but it's an audio app that tells children bedtime stories Mm -hmm. and they go into this huge array of these stories and so they could have a different one every night if they want or they could revisit the same ones but it's a it's a fantasy land that they're going into and they follow the story it gives them something to focus on to take their thoughts away from where's my mom is there anything I can do to bring my mom back in the room why does it feel weird to be alone what if I just went over and bopped my brother on the head would that be fun (laughs) you know (laughs) Um, but it it parks their attention mm-hmm. in a happy place and allows their body to take over with the fatigue that's already there. So you're seeing a lot of adrenaline at that point. Um, and that means that they're sleepy, but their their body's telling them to fight sleep. And it may mean that they're they're going to bed a little too late. Um, or the wind down isn't, you know, somehow doing the trick, or it's the that feeling of like, wait a second, I don't want to go to bed, I don't want you to leave. Whatever's causing that, it's riling them up. And if you can give them something to do, instead of just being like, you're on your own, kid, leave and, and shut the door, you give them something to do so that they're occupied in a in a productive, pleasant, happy way. The body's natural fatigue is going to take over. So, but getting there, going from two kids that, you know, they have this certain structure, they get excited to read with their dad, and then either he has to be in there until they fall asleep or a babysitter has to be there until they fall asleep because if mommy goes in there, it's two hours of like right. really, really. And I, they, it, it's so funny because they're like, mommy, you don't love me? Mommy, <laughs> you going to leave? But are you going to leave? Like it gets into this whole dramatic thing. No, 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 I love you. And then you have to threaten me be like, if you don't stop doing that, I'm going to leave the room right now. Right. Like I try everything. I'm like, you know, pressing all the buttons. Does this combination work? Does this combination work? And it just equals an unpleasant experience for everybody. But like if somebody else goes in there, they're like done in like five, ten minutes. They're right. sleeping. But maybe that's part of the problem because it's a threat that you're going to leave. But it's an eventuality. You're going to, at some point you are going but, to no, leave. But no, the problem is I don't leave. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but, I, but, I, but, I, but I think that's I, don't I, I think that's I mean that's really that's actually exactly right too and I I wonder like at a certain point obviously it makes you feel good as a as a parent as a mother that your kids want you to stay and and you do want to stay like it's your you know bedtime can be a really magical perfect mm-hmm. time to be with your kids because they're 
they're so sweet and like I I personally feel like it's when I thrive. Like I'm really good at bedtime stories and like all of that, and I love it. Um, but at, but I feel like you. I wonder what would happen if they, like they know Alec is going to walk out. He's going to do his bit and he's going to walk out. And like the babysitter is going to do her bit and then walk out. And I wonder what would happen if you tried a week of like, "Mommy's here. Mommy loves you so much. We do our thing." And now I'm going to walk out too. No, but they follow me. They don't. But also, they they're not. Alec and the babysitter are not leaving while they're awake. It's just taking them not as long to fall asleep yes. because they're there. They stay in the room till they fall asleep. So step wow. one, if you were my client, this <laughs> is what wild. I would tell you. Step one is getting them to fall asleep for Alec and the babysitter without them being in the room. Oh, okay. It's also not a terrible thing to put a gate up on their door. They will climb it. They will take. They it make tall ones. No, no, no! You don't understand these. Are my, these are my monkey Zoo children. Animals. There's a there. I've seen people put one on top of the other, like really? basically making a screen door. There's you have to stay a step ahead of them because you're the parent, right? And and your job first and foremost is to keep them safe, um, then it's to keep them healthy, and then it's to keep them happy. So they have to. They've gone from being in a crib to being in a bed and having the run of the house Mm -hmm. because there's no boundary there. That's a huge change. And they don't have the frontal lobe capacity to inhibit their impulse to run around and try to make it into a game. They can do it when they have a different figure in the room, but they can't do it with you. And so there has to be a way to keep them in the room without having to throw them in the room and slam the door and, you know, throw away the key. A general way to just say, this is a reminder for you to stay in your room because at nighttime, you need to stay in your room. That's what we do. I stay in my room at nighttime, you stay in your room at nighttime. And with repetition, that is not punitive, it's limit setting. And it's so important for kids to have those limits, not in a authoritarian way. We're talking, we're not talking about random, nonsensical rules the way that, you know, our parents were raised. This is like, these are the rules that I make as a parent to keep you safe. And sometimes you don't like them, but it's okay. It's okay for you to be upset about that. I know it's, it's, you don't like it, but that's what we're going to do. And with repetition, you become the authority figure that they need you to be um, in doing that. So what I would do in the situation is I would find a way to keep them in their room that doesn't feel like jail. It's possible. You just have to get creative. Um, I would start with everyone but you putting them to bed in the final step and leaving the room while they're awake. And I would use this app, the okay. Mashi I'll Twilight, because the other thing is you start gradually where Alec or your sitter would sit with them while they listen to the stories. So first the, first the association is the only thing that's changing is we're adding something. I'm not just throwing a bone and leaving the room. So you you add it, you have a positive association of what they already know to be bedtime with with their dad. And then after a few days or maybe a week, he starts to leave before it's over. And mm-hmm. he can explain, tonight when we start the story, um, I'm going to leave and I'll come back and check on you in 10 minutes. Or, you know, and you work out a schedule that makes sense with that. If and you can also make that checking conditional on them doing the right thing. So I can only come back and check on you if you're in your beds. If you're not in your beds, I'm not going to come in. There's no punishment. You just don't get the reward of me coming and checking on you. Um, and so there's a way to kind of gradually ease into that. And then eventually, you don't. it's just part of the routine and you do it as well. Mm-hmm. But the key is going to be you separating your feelings that you have about not giving not providing for all of their requests because they know exactly which buttons to push Mm -hmm. um and separating that from what they need you to do which is teach them how to master this skill right no i would i would love i would love nothing more but it's amazing how like i go in there and i'm like i'm gonna do exactly what everybody else does i'm gonna sit right here on the floor and I'm and the, bless sorry, you. Sorry, <laughs> the light the lights are off. Everything. I kiss them. I'm like, I love you. And then you hear, but you're not gonna lay with me. And then I'll go in like, I like if after like ten minutes, it's like it's heightened. I'm like, okay, fine, fine, fine. And then the other one's like, but that's not fair. And it like ends up just being this whole, it's a thing. It's bad. Yeah. It's bad. And they they win, they win every single <sighs> time. 
You can also like write your own bedtime story book where you go through the bedtime routine with them. Um, and that can be a way to prepare them for what's coming. Mm -hmm. There are also a lot of, of bedtime books that have a routine in them where the mom or the dad leaves before the kid's asleep. Um, there was my, my favorite for my kids was called Kiss Goodnight, um, an oldie but a goodie. But, and you know, they go through the whole t routine and then the mom leaves and it's even a dark and stormy night when it's happening. Oh, wow. I have to, I have to look at a heightened you, response. You yeah. were talking before about sleep regression, and I, I want, Daphne had like a really interesting oh. point. Yeah, oh, um, I do. And I thank you for reminding me of that because it had totally slipped my brain. Um, and I wanted to say to you, though, I think you can both win. I think that you can win and get some real sleep, and I think your children can win and still feel like mommy loves them and Absolutely. would love to stay with them. I don't want them to be traumatized. Um, they will not be traumatized. <laughs> um, something I did, because I remembered that I like I I bought my kids old boom boxes that uh -huh. they because I wanted them to be able to figure out uh, how to you know how to put a CD in and press play and then because right. you know, just just because I grew up falling asleep to books on tape sometimes uh -huh. and I always loved and even to this day if I can't fall asleep if my brain is racing I will listen to a story I've heard before or I will listen to a podcast I've heard before or something just be, mm -hmm. for 10 minutes because the lulling noise of that talking will put me to sleep but I've noticed that for my um, five-year-old that sometimes really helps her too this Mashi app is interesting and, and guys listening at home Dr. Kennedy is able to offer all of us a code it's mom brain sleep if you put that into the app you'll actually get six months free of the service so if you want to try it out with mm -hmm. your kids that'll be awesome but it really is just like you know i'll let her listen to a stories podcast or whatever and it, it um it helps her fall asleep when she cannot fall asleep but something that i started doing once i got the boom boxes was i recorded myself as a voice note on my phone reading their favorite books uh -huh. and then i burned it onto a cd so they all have their like mixtape cds of their favorite of me reading them their favorite oh, books so cool. which they love a because they can like press play on it whenever you know they can listen to the ones that they love and they have their own own, like music discs too that are oh, their favorite songs and things but anyway I've, I found that to be really effective yeah. uh, uh, if because uh, you reminded me when you said you know about the bedtime stories that involve a routine where the parent is saying goodnight in a very loving way and then leaving before the baby falls asleep um, question about sleep regression okay so my my five year old Philomena who was always my best sleeper has now in the last six months I would say decided that A I think she does have actual nightmares uh, periodically like she tells us that she has this dream where there are you know alligators or like crocodiles <laughs> in the bed with her mm -hmm. and she has to slap them <laughs> there's this whole you know crocodile <laughs> thing crocodile <laughs> dandy there she slaps them she slaps them she gets out her like Indiana Jones whip <laughs> and whatever but she wants to get in bed with us she wants to sleep with us uh you know she really it, it is it is happening more regularly and um and unpredictably I guess okay and I'm curious where that comes from and how to deal with it and mediate it. The one thing that I have found is that um, we, we've we started – I tape a dollar to the wall of her bedroom. Yes. And I say, this is your dollar if you stay in your room all night. <laughs> and that is hugely motivating. Kids, kids yeah. love money. They're like, yes. Um, I don't, they don't know what she's going to use it for. But, um, but that has actually made a big difference because she feels a level of pride in being Absolutely. able to snatch that off the wall in the morning. But but where does that come from and, and how do we deal with it? There's two – Two main possibilities. One is that she's waking up for some other reason, and she knows that if she says she's scared, she'll get the response she wants from you. Um, so because it's very hard to say to a child who's frightened that they've had a nightmare, like, you're on your own, kid, like, see in the morning. Right. Um, and it's really not appropriate. Um, you know, if they really are truly frightened and they need you, then you have to do something. But it can easily become a habit if they sort of learn that that's the ticket. Yeah. The other possibility is that something is triggering this nightmare, whether it's something she's watching or a transition that's happening where she's just feeling more agitated and anxious. I would, you know, do a little, I'm sure you have, exploration of what might be triggering this. Um, but typically, my first approach is to figure out if a child is overtired, because most sleep regressions come at times of sleep transitions. Mm. So they come around eight months when they're going from three naps to two. They come around a year and a half when they're dropping to um, one nap, or they come when they're dropping uh, their nap altogether. Um, and that, because the reason that happens is because they're suddenly going 
um, for a much longer time between mm-hmm. the nap and bedtime, and they're getting overtired. So when I was talking before about adrenaline, this is really, really key. Um, what happens when the body is overtired is that it releases adrenaline. We are very, very primitive beings. Um, we have one response to a threat that is fight or flight, and it's designed to keep us awake. So it works in the exact opposite way that would be helpful when we're when the problem is that we're exhausted. Um, but huh. if you think about yourself, you're tired and you need to get up and go to work. You get a little adrenaline to get you through. And and that's really helpful. So but for kids, it's really disruptive. So anytime there's um, a lot of frustration, protests um, or delays at bedtime, Night waking or early waking, the first thing I look at is the bedtime to see if it has crept too late. And now that the days are getting longer, that happens, that tends to happen. What is the ideal bedtime? Well, it depends on your kid's age. For babies and toddlers, it's typically around seven. Sometimes it's, you know, I usually say plus or minus 30 minutes. For a five year old, you said? Yes. So for a five year old, Probably 7, 7.30 because she's not napping, right? No, so the thing you can do is track it, right? If you try putting her to bed even 15 minutes earlier mm-hmm. than usual, often that's enough because it's just that moment when you cross over into wired from tired that causes all the disruption. Right. It's a matter of hitting it before that adrenaline before the releases. Adrenaline. Yeah. That's interesting because her bedtime, as she will tell you emphatically, is 7.30. Okay. <laughs> she, you know, um, but I think, you know, sometimes that means getting in bed at 7.20 to start the whole, you know, t- negotiation over how many books we're going to read yeah. and then the reading and then Lights the questions. should be 7.30. You know, there's like 50 questions. The more tired she gets, the more questions there are about every single nuance and wording right. and whatever of the book. And I think that's right. I think if it's asleep by 7.30, that mm-hmm. might be a better strategy or for Or lights us. out. Lights out. So the other thing I wanted to say about your um, your technique Yes, um, <laughs> the dollar the bill. The dollar bill. <laughs> so you can also do that with play money mm-hmm. and have them earn rewards. It's not just that the reward is the money, which some people might huh. not love. You can do it, and I, this I'm stealing from my um, daughter's second grade teacher, who used to give behavior bucks and citizenship behavior bucks yeah, and whatever. That. And so the kids would start to accumulate these bucks, and then there was a menu of things that they could buy with them. And the in the end, the culmination was like 150 bucks. You could get a bagel lunch with the teacher. How fun. And it worked. Uh, shout out to Stephanie Simon. Um, <laughs> genius. But it worked so well because they, as they started to learn that they could accumulate these things, that they could succeed, um, then they were more and more motivated. And they would save up for the bigger prizes. And the idea of having the prize being an experience a extra time with you, yeah. something that you share together as opposed to like, you know, a toy. I a love toy. that. I'm totally going to lift that. Love That's that so much fun. Best. And you can also really personalize it for your family because right. there are very few times when any of my children get to do like big excursions with me alone. Usually we're all kind of traveling like pack animals. Um, you know, periodically feel when I will go get our nails done together or something like right. that. But I think it's something really fun where it's, where you can again, you can say we're going to go to the beach, just the two of us for half or an hour, or to the shop. coffee shop for half an hour, it, or or take a walk in the park, or yeah. go you know look at puppies. Or like it's whatever. so rewarding for them, yeah. so special. Bagel and lunch is rewarding know, to anyone. Right? Totally, <laughs> right? It's amazing most how big of how big of a deal a bagel is. We do that in my family. We do. Um, I give them patches throughout the day right. for like things that they do good, and then I can also take them away. Okay, they can lose the patches, and then they they get very into that. Yeah. But the menu thing, I the think, menu is cool thing because is that's – I've been trying to teach her about – we talked about this. We had Alexa Von Tobel um, on the podcast a couple months ago, and we were talking about money management and about how do you instill – value at an early age because kids don't understand what dollars and cents mean they don't understand they're not you know it depends at what point in math they are but they don't even understand how they tally up and to understand what value is appropriate for different things and and that interestingly on you know sort of a subconscious level that experience is always more valuable than material Mm -hmm. i really love that lesson can you talk to us a little bit you know more generically for people listening at home what are some of the most common sleep disorders or the signs of them? And uh, uh, we're talking mostly children under the age mm-hmm. of 10, I would say. And, um, and, and how do you address them? The primary distinction between a medical sleep disorder and a behavioral sleep disorder. I deal primarily with behavioral sleep disorders, although right. some of my clients have both. 
Um, so a medical sleep disorder would be something like snoring, sleep apnea, um, any kind of obstruction that's interfering with breathing at night. So typically the treatment for that involves an ENT and you mm-hmm. would look at adenoids and um, maybe using nasal sprays or see if, if adenoids or tonsils need to come out or if other things can be done. There are also um, parasomnias, which are night terrors and sleepwalking. Those are sort of a combination. I mean, they're, they're definitely medical in that they, there's something neurological going on and um, causing this disorder. And, you, you know, if someone's sleepwalking, there's not a lot you can do in the moment to, to prevent that. However, those uh, symptoms of those disorders are dramatically increased when kids are overtired or when they're going to bed in a stressful way. Um, so in those situations, I would work with people on the schedule and consistency and smoothing out any battles that are happening at bedtime. So what I see in the, um, I would say, zero to four set is um, an inability to self-soothe and a need to develop independent sleep skills. So typically that is happening because they're overtired. Either they're overtired because they can't sleep independently and they're just stuck in a rut, or they're overtired because they're on a schedule that's not appropriate for them. Also, they haven't learned how to self-soothe and get into sleep on their own. Um, because when, as I said before, what ends up happening is they start to need a lot of help, but the help stops being helpful, mm-hmm. um, where the parents are intervening a lot. It's just overstimulating the kid. They might go to sleep for 20 minutes and then they're up again, like, and you've got a big old problem there. So in those cases, I work with parents to, um, first of all, understand the basic science of sleep and, and how to work with the child's body instead of against it. Um, I also work with them to help them understand how limit setting is good for healthy attachment and not and not terrible for attachment, as some people would have you believe. Then set up a plan with routines and a plan for how they're how they're going to respond or not respond when their child is doing the thing they don't want to. So if it's a, a younger baby and we're talking about you know frequent night waking we would probably do cry it out without a lot of bells and whistles because it's better to just stay out and you know i mean there's all kinds of different contingencies in terms of does it does a child really need to eat at night most of them don't by the time they're ready for cry it out but you know i'd certainly develop an individualized plan then as kids get older you start to have um more uh, their their sleep changes as they get older, and they stop being able to sleep on command. So when they're young, you're doing this kind of um, sensory deprivation sort of thing where you're like, here you are, this is your crib, it's dark in here, go to sleep now. And you giving them those commands actually helps them to be like, okay, this is what I have to do, and they go to sleep as little tiny babies. <laughs> um, <laughs> But as they get older, they're more like us. And as you know, when you dive into bed and you're like, okay, I want to sleep right now, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Um, They need a wind down. They need to learn how to let sleep come to them instead of trying to force it. So oftentimes there's there's a mismatch between where the kid is and where the parents are. The parents want their kids to be in bed, done for the night. They won't want to be done parenting. Rightly so. It's been a long day. Um, the kid needs to be getting good sleep, but the pressure to sleep on that schedule can start to be a problem. And so that's when I work with parents on, okay, what can your kid do by themselves to be alone and be calm and keep the mind from racing, keep the fears from taking over, um, but and and then allow the fatigue to come when it's, when it's going to. I often tell people um, when I'm working with adults, Don't try to sleep. Let sleep come to you. And that was a big lesson for me when my son hit this phase, my oldest child, um, because he was, he just kept coming downstairs and being like, I can't do this. I don't know what the problem is. And we're like, just go try, just go try. And and finally, at one point, he was like, "You're the sleep doctor. Tell me what to do." <laughs> and and you know, we finally with him hit on. You just need to read. Like it's okay to read. And his body changed, and he turned into a night owl like his dad. And um, 
he just got into being alone and reading until his body was Tired. ready for it. What, um, do you, what do you do to go to bed? What's your, what is your routine? I read. I do read. And I, I, so I do like a basic sort of, you know, my very basic beauty routine, um, just washing my face and doing whatever topicals I'm doing. Um, and at this point, my son is usually still up. My, and um, my daughter's usually in bed. Um, but I will go into my room. I close my door. I keep my dog out even. It's just me in my room. And I read in bed until, um, until my body says, you got it. And I started doing this when I was in grad school because um, my mind was just going in so many different directions. And I, at one point, woke my husband up in in like a sleep talking episode where I was administering psychological tests to my pillow <laughs> and he was like this something's got to give here so I started reading fiction and it was such a pleasure to do it even though I couldn't stay awake more than a couple pages yeah but it I felt like it scrubbed all the garbage out of my head mm-hmm. for the night and improved my sleep quality and um, it's been something I've relied on since then. Are you? Are, do you like fall asleep and the book is like on top of you and it's like you rarely? Know, you know, do you, the, you actually like? Okay, I'm tired. I'm gonna close the book. Well, put it over there. With a lot of Tuck practice. Yeah, with a lot of practice. But initially, like if I'm if I'm feeling very stressed and you know since I was in grad school, life's only been more complicated. You know, I have two kids. I've got a, you know a mortgage. I've got a business that I built from the ground up, and uh, you know it's not an easy job and Um, So I've got a lot going on. And, um, you know, so there are times when I'm more wired at night. So I've learned to be more attuned to that. And I know, for example, Sunday nights, I'm going to be up later and I'm going to be reading longer because it takes longer to wind down Mm -hmm. and you're out of your rhythm. And that's just okay. And if you're not stressed out about that by Monday night, you're back on track. Um, so yeah, you you build that association. It's a, it becomes a sleep association itself, and um, you know it drove my kids crazy because when I would read to them, I'd be yawning the whole time. Yes. <laughs> it's a very strong sleep association, but at the same time, it's so helpful, and and it it is really a peaceful time. And and as a you know busy working mom, it's like that moment of just like. This is me. Me time. Yeah. Me time. Remember that that brings yes. back the Alexa von Tobel as well. Yes. Do you read like really like re- relaxing like lovely books or are you are you reading like horror books? I <laughs> <laughs> I read I mean, fiction. Right I place. read good fiction. I read um you know sometimes I'll read lighter stuff um but I don't read nonfiction at night. Um I think fiction is important because you have to create the images and you're you're going into a fantasy land, just like you know I was talking before about the app. I, it's something that requires your brain to do something, dissociate from reality. Yeah, and stop in feeling a happy like you're place. living in the real world. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a dis- enough of a distraction that you you almost trick your body into it every single night. What do you make of the sleep supplements like the melatonins of the world for kids and for adults and particularly for travel? I have had more than one parent be like, oh, just dose your kids with melatonin before you get on the plane if you're you know, heading on overseas or yeah. on a long plane ride. What's um, your thought on that? So my thought on melatonin is that it is best for jet lag um, because melatonin is a hormone that your body produces naturally. You do not have a deficit of it, and re- that requires supplementation. Um, as a sleep aid, um, if you need, a, if you're a person who's suffering from insomnia on a regular basis, and you find yourself needing sleep aids, a lot of the time, I would recommend therapy instead. Uh, there, you know, the treatment I give is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI, short term. You don't have to get down and dirty with your entire past. You're fixing the problem and getting back on track. What does that normally look like? Is that like one trigger anxiety point for people? Or is if it's a short-term sort of corrective the treatment? process? Yeah. The treatment is it starts, we track your sleep with a sleep diary um, and figure out what's happening day to day. Is it really a problem every day? Is it only when you drink? Is it only when on Sunday nights? These things, you know, figuring out what's really happening is important. And then we do um, work on sleep on sleep hygiene. Things like, okay, seventeen cups of coffee looks like it's not working for you. Let's try <laughs> to get that down to something more reasonable and at a reasonable time of day. 
Um, and then, and also routines and making sure that you're unplugging from technology at a reasonable hour um, and that you're not doing things in bed like working um, that you know make the bed into a stressful place. And then we move into sleep restriction, which means figuring out um, how much time you should spend in bed to get the amount of sleep you need. Um, and it really actually helps us figure out how much sleep people need. By restricting the amount of time people can be in bed, it helps to consolidate their sleep because people with sleep problems tend to spend a ton of time in bed mm -hmm. for not a lot of sleep. Mm. Um, so we do the sleep res restriction, discontinue medications if that's part of the picture, and then work on then the cognitive part, which is the anxieties and the misconceptions about sleep that keep you doing things that don't help. What about meditation? I am very pro meditation. I think meditation is wonderful for mental health in general and for sleep. I don't so much love meditation as a sleep aid. Mm -hmm. Like the problem with doing a meditation app to fall asleep is that if you don't accomplish that goal, you'll have a paradoxical effect um, mm -hmm. and get more anxious. So if you know it's a 20 minute meditation and you're reaching about 15 minutes and, and you're not getting there, your, your heart's gonna start racing and you'll start to get agitated. But certainly a, a daily or almost daily meditation practice is going to be tremendously helpful for stress and for sleep. Sorry, I cut you off though. You were saying melatonin. melatonin. Yes. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. I know. Everybody wants to know about melatonin. <laughs> so, um, okay, so it's a hormone that you make naturally. You don't need to supplement it. It does work as a short term sleep aid. I would not give that to children unless there's a jet lag issue because m melatonin will help reset the body clock. Um, and that's really the only thing I would use it for with children. And you would want to talk to your doctor about dosing and make sure it's okay. If they're taking anything else sedating, like antihistamines, n probably not a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, for adults, as an occasional sleep aid, fine. Um, but there are better ones available. The other, the other issue with melatonin is that the dosages you see on the shelf are often too high. Um, and there's often melatonin in mixtures. Mm. Um, so there's, you know, if you're taking like this thing for calming and that thing for, you know, whatever, there's probably melatonin sprinkled all through that. And you want to be you want to really read the labels um, because the, the therapeutic dose for melatonin is something like 0.3 to 1 milligram. And most of these things have three to five or 10 milligrams in them. Yeah. So that's going to give you too much. You're going to be hung over. Um, and it's, it's not, those doses aren't actually found to be particularly helpful for insomnia. Mm. I want to uh, give you a chance to talk about anything that you think the average parent is struggling with unnecessarily mm -hmm. when it comes to sleep at this critical juncture in ch early childhood. I think that um, the conflict that we have between wanting to be everything for our kids and be a great mom or a great dad um, and then being the kind of parent who's really um, raising confident, healthy, independent kids um, is really a tricky one. And I don't minimize that at all because we you know there's there's such a biological pull for us to to do everything for them and make them stop crying because our brains are wired for that and also the things you read about what what parenting styles is going to you know what this style is going to do versus that style and those messages can be really scary and they scare us into doing nothing um, so I think it's really important to value yourself as a parent and think about what you need to be able to be the parent you're supposed to be, um, that you want to be. And that means doing some things that are uncomfortable, um, learning to tolerate your child being uncomfortable, allowing them to learn how to figure some things out, that that peace really makes all the difference. I find that the people I work with whose kids naturally start to sleep through the night are people who are more tolerant 
of noise from their child early on and they don't run in and try to fix it um, right away. And that gives a child more time to go back to sleep on their own. Um, you know, I certainly found that with my second child, I would have to put her down because my older child was doing something and needed attention. And by the time I would get back to her, she'd be asleep. You know, <laughs> it's like, so she, you know, and that wasn't harmful. That was just like, she's saying to me, I don't want to be here. I don't like it. Um, I, you know, please, do you really mean this? All in just by crying. And I'm saying, yes, I do mean it. This is what we're doing now. It's really time to sleep. And she got the picture. Yeah. So. What about these monitors? I, ne- I never had oh. one, but the monitors where you can talk to your child through the monitor. I I don't see the reason to do that, um, partly because you want to remove yourself from the equation. You being present at all is going to lead them to want more, um, it, especially if they're upset. And so, you know, if they're trying to say, I can't sleep, I don't want to sleep, and you're saying, go to sleep, you know, it's really okay – That reads as you needing them to be okay, like you needing them to be happy and not distressed. And that also communicates that there's something wrong with being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and that they can't do it by themselves. Because I've seen, I've been on like play dates and if they have a younger child, so sort of, you know, they they hear the baby and they can turn on the monitor and they can see and they go, shh, it's okay, I'm here, shh. And the baby's kind of looking around. And the, yeah. baby, and the baby's the like, yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. work. Where are you? The, the other thing I w- I'm curious about is, um, you know, without naming name brands, there's all these gimmicky beds that yes. will, like, rock Yes, I know what you're talking forth. about. Yes, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, what are your thoughts on that? So I'm mixed on, I think, I mean, in general, I find technology, um, over-technologizing sleep, is a slippery slope. And I think that ultimately, most kids don't need it. Um, That said, I had a colicky baby who would not be put down between the hours of like 1am and 4am for six weeks. And it beat me down. I mean, it was really, really hard. And, you know, I found some solution of putting her in the vibrating rocker and having my foot on it and like whatever. And it was crazy. (laughs) And so, you know, yes, if I maybe something more elaborate would have been helpful. But um, the problem with those things is that you start to rely on them a little too much. And it's hard to then get your child out of it and into something more natural, Um, you know. I also, I'm a huge believer in white noise, but I do not think white noise should be right in the child's ear. So there are some devices that do that. And, um, you know, to me, white noise is better placed to create a sound screen in the room and not the effect of like a hairdryer on the child's head. Right. Um, so, and I also think that children need to learn how to sleep stationary. They're not necessarily ready to do that when they come out of the womb, but they do need to learn how to do that. And so constant jiggling and swinging, you know, past, certainly past like the 10 week mark, I think is going to prevent independent sleep more than it's going to necessarily promote it. Now, there are always going to be exceptions to that. And, And as I said, maybe something like that would have changed my whole postpartum experience. And um, you know, it's very possible. So I don't want to say a blanket no, mm-hmm. um, but I do think, you know, the first few months are hard. Babies are, you know, they need a lot of, you know, a lot of hands-on stuff. And um, there's not an easy solution to that, um, nor should there be, because a lot of what they need is our hands on them. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, it's not that you should be holding them all night, but you also get more attuned to them when you're paying attention. Right. Now we definitely made that mistake with the, with my second one. So with Rafa, um, he was in. I, I'm a big fan of the Fisher. Maybe I shouldn't be, but I am of the the Fisher Price um, rockers that you actually mm-hmm. rock, you bounce with your feet. 
yes. then they can see you. They're looking at you. They're holding their loveys on either side. And they're like, I'm watching you. And you're rocking them. And then they go to sleep. And then he stayed in that until he was solid on the floor. Like he would go yeah. and climb into it and would be like, would like bend the whole thing because he was so <laughs> heavy and be like on the floor in it. And then it was hard because the next one, they're only 14 and a half months apart. Right. So then he would see, he's like, why does he get to have right. one? Right. Right. I don't get to have one. It was like major issues. So I, I like that low tech approach to it. I just think you, you have to be mindful of where they are developmentally. So at eight weeks, that's a godsend. At 12 weeks, he doesn't need it. And so and at two years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, yeah. but if you if you transition out of those things earlier, it's easier. Right. right. And so you would say, OK, look, he's always he's always getting a really good stretch at the first part of the night in that thing. So why don't we try to do that for a stretch in the crib and right. see if he can do that or in the the first nap of the day is you, the first one that's usually easier to come by and so you would do that one in the crib and see what you can get right. and you can also do the thing where you ease out of rocking before you ease out of the th- the device Got it. so that's what in, we always do yeah instead of rocking the whole time he's asleep you're just rocking until he's asleep and then you're just rocking to get him settled and then you're not rocking at all and then you're doing the crib so Got you can it. sort of step back and i go through a lot of these sort of um, easing into independent sleep strategies in my book, The Good Sleeper. Um, and, you know, they they often work. But if they don't, it's okay to then move on. And you should move on and teach them to fall asleep in the crib by letting them get upset about it. I'm working currently with the Mashi Twilight app, um, which is a sleep story app for children. It gives them bedtime stories to help them go off to sleep peacefully in the night without their parents in and, the room. And listeners of Mom Brain can try that for six months for free using the code MOMBRAINSLEEP. So you can find me online at nycsleepdoctor.com. I'm also on Facebook, NYC Sleep Doctor, and Twitter, um, NYC Sleep Doctor. 